It's an energy convention presided over by Putin, during which Royal Dutch Shell President Jeroen van der Veen rose and thanked Putin for his wisdom in uh, agreeing to this settlement because Royal Dutch Shell was afraid that it might lose much more from those environmental suits or that it might be kicked out of Russia altogether and lose the entire investment. But they got away with losing only $5 billion. And it was not Jeroen van der Veen who, who, who lost those $5 billion. It was the shareholders who did. But on behalf, presumably, of the shareholders, he profusely thanked Putin for his wisdom in agreeing to this settlement. In the next uh, case, uh, last fall, BP, uh, which uh, lost uh, its majority stake in the giant gas uh, project at Kovekta in uh, Siberia. But BP got a one year brief. The Russian courts ruled that it lost it. But the Russian government gave it a one year brief. If BP cedes to Rosneft or Gazprom, Russian state companies, some BP assets in the West that would be attractive to the Russian state companies then BP might be partly forgiven and might be allowed to stay at Kovacta or be it as a minority shareholder. Uh, this too is part of uh, Russia's tactics of acquiring assets, refining assets, processing assets, and distribution assets downstream in the West. So that's the idea of uh, reciprocal access. And the next idea is that of mutual dependency, which is very popular and you're hearing a lot in the European Union. We and Russia are mutually dependent on energy, of energy, because just as we depend on Russian uh, energy delivery, so does Russia depend on the stream of hard currency income from the EU. So this makes a, for a mutual dependency. And it's even beneficial, beneficial for the long term. Well, this is false for the following reason. Russia, with its state-controlled energy companies, acts as a single actor in selling its energy. It is a single seller. But as long as the European Union does not have a unified energy policy, the buyers in the West are a multiplicity of buyers, uncoordinated with each other, and frequently in rivalry with each other, frequently in competition with each other, and indeed sometimes among companies in cutthroat competition among each other, to demonstrate that they have uh, more, uh, more, uh, uh, more proven gas and oil reserves than their rivals. Uh, their share prices at Western stock exchanges depend to a large extent on business in Russia. So you have this multiplicity of Western uh, energy companies interested in making their own deals with the Russian government in rivalry with many other Western companies. And the Russians are masters at playing these actors against each other. The same is true of Western governments that are promoting the interests of so-called national champions, the dominant energy companies in the respective countries. And so the mutual dependency cannot exist and cannot operate until the European Union develops a common energy policy and acts as a single market in relation to the Russian single seller. But this is not on the cards, it's still a long way from occurring. And before it occurs, we can, uh, we in the West can experience a lot of losses in terms of infrastructure resulting from this asymmetrical situation. So there is no reciprocal access and no mutual dependency. So the timekeeper is signaling. I'll try to conclude. Uh, the third and final aspect of the uh, of the uh, mutual incompatibilities that I wanted to to address has to do with uh, still existing gray zone, so-called gray zone, gray zone, between, on the one hand, the large European Union, NATO, and on the other hand, Russia. This gray zone which existed historically for centuries, and uh, which is where many European war wars, including both world wars, originated. 
This grey zone has uh, shrunk after the fall of the Soviet Union, and this is the single greatest gain to the West from the downfall of the Soviet Union. The fact that the grey zone between uh, <coughs> the historic West and Russia has largely joined the West. And it is not a process of Western enlargement, NATO or EU enlargement, as is frequently and not entirely correctly represented. It is a process of nations in this area running to the West, to join Western institutions, such as NATO and the European Union. Um, there are two major areas that are still outside of the institutional West, NATO and the EU, and are subject, potentially, to Russian reconquest. These are Ukraine and Moldova in Europe, and Georgia and Azerbaijan in the South Caucasus. We should not be shy about discussing the strategic significance of these areas. The first used to be known historically as the Ponto Baltic Isthmus, the narrow part of Europe between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, historic battleground, historic uh, terrain of contest, of contest between East and West. Ukraine is the major piece in this area, still in dispute, still not yet adjudicated by either Russia or the West. The way Ukraine turns will have a huge impact on the balance of power in Europe. And the other area, the South Caucasus, is a vital two-way corridor for Europe and for NATO. It is an east-west corridor for the transit of Caspian energy to Europe, and the west-east corridor for the projection of NATO and EU influence operations and power from core Europe to the Greater Middle East and Central Asia and Afghanistan. This is the corridor formed by Georgia and Azerbaijan. NATO and the European Union need to integrate both of these areas, Ukraine and the Georgia-Azerbaijan corridor. And because the timekeeper is single, I'll stop here, but we can continue this during the Q&A period. Thank you.